Fire and we're up. TJ, what's up, brother? Thank you yeah, for joining man. me on the podcast. What's up, man? It's good to uh, good to see you, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Yeah, so this is cool. So we already started talking, and I'm like, you know what? I The best part of the podcast is the first couple minutes where I get to really get to know the guest a little bit, and I never record that part. And I'm like, well, why don't we just record that? Because now, right, now I have this, and uh, and so here we are. And so, TJ, man, you and I met uh, last month down in Frederick County where you're a firefighter. Um, you were speaking at the Key City Conference, and uh, our paths crossed. And uh, I just thought it was an incredible opportunity to get to know you a little bit more. And I know you have, uh, you know, just a, an unbelievable story on many fronts. Um, and, uh, and you talked about the, the being grounded. You were wearing, I think you were wearing, were you wearing flip-flops or Tevas? What, uh, what were you rocking wearing... on your feet? We'll call them Jesus cruisers, right? Nah. They're just barefoot shoes. Yeah. <laughs> I love that, man. And uh, yeah. and so on. So it really intrigued me. And so, you know, you and I started talking. And um, and so I love interesting people. And I love people with a story. And uh, and so I'm excited today to get to know you a little bit through the podcast and hear your story. So here we are, man. I appreciate you joining me this morning. Yeah, absolutely, man. I'm super stoked to be here for sure. So we were just talking about it. You're living that ski life, that, that ski bum life. I want to hear about this, man, because all the homework I did, uh, father, husband, firefighter, triathlete, yoga practitioner, meditator, trauma uh, conqueror, Medal of Valor recipient, past ski bum, ski patroller, Iron Man. The list goes on and on, and I love the one thing, high vibe and energy. I love yeah, that. you know, I think uh... – I think that high vibe and energy uh, really came through all the trauma that I went through, you know, and tried to turn it into more of a growth aspect instead of that, um, that world we can really fall into very easily of becoming the victim, you know, and just be having a really slow world and just very traumatized and start seeing the world in a negative mentality, you know. So the more trauma I was involved in, I feel, uh, I was very blessed to be able to really look at the light of that and change my life in order to... Uh, pursue that happiness that I think everyone's currently looking for in life. Well, let's talk about that a little bit, right? I mean, trauma, it, trauma comes in many different forms. And uh, I know you've had certainly your share and, and, uh, and so on. I want to talk about that a little bit because I think it's really has, you know, uh, made you who you are today in a way. Um, yeah, absolutely. Focusing, finding new direction, new purpose. Uh, and so on. And that was something that really stood out to me. And so I don't know where you want to take this or how we want to start, but I mean, maybe just chapter one, a little bit about yourself and then, uh, and then we can roll through life and, and kind of figure out, uh, how we got here today. Yeah, sure. Dude. I'd love to uh, yeah. have that opportunity for sure. Uh, so I don't know how far you want to dive because my story is pretty wild. We'll say, so let's do it, man. I got uh, time. Let's roll. Yeah. You know, uh, I was very blessed. Um, I can say that now going through my journey, you know, I was blessed to have the journey that I had, even though it difficult at times. Um, my mother was cultivated a really incredible environment for us to be okay with change, right? My mm. father left to uh, pursue a professional racing career when I was around two. And, you know, I felt like it took about 33 years to understand that a little deeper to where I can actually grow from that. Got it. Um, because I felt like I was the victim of that world, right? And I didn't have the father that was there uh, to show me all the things about life and cultivate that environment to push me through the struggles. You know, and I had a stepdad that came along uh, when I was about eight to 10 who's super rad, super incredible, super motivating. Uh, but it wasn't the same of being your blood dad, right? Um, so growing up, we moved around a lot. And, um, when my mom got remarried, he worked for Enron and we got moved to Iowa. Mm. So I went through high school and then I went to college in Iowa where I got my fire science degree, you know, and it was, a, it was an interesting time because all my friends were like, what do you want to be, dude? What are you going to do? And it wasn't even a thought in my mind. Like since I was five years old, I was going to be a firefighter. There was no, really? there was no thoughts about it, dude. Like for whatever the case, I sat in the front seat of that truck one day and I was like, this is what I'm going to do. This is rad, dude. This is a sweet gig. You remember love- those moments. I do, dude. And my mom had a photo of that. Um, and it, it definitely brings me back to that, you know, and the more wow. healing that I do with the trauma work, the more I'm able to remember my childhood and just having those conversations because I deleted a lot of that, that I didn't like. Right. So I'm trying to find times to move back into those times to find the gratitude and the lessons that were there. Um, so when we were 
going into that college state, all my friends were like, well, I'm going to this community college. And I'm like, well, let's see what their fire division looks like, you know, and they had the curriculum. And I went into Kirkwood Community College in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And I did what most people do is take a two-year degree and turn it into a three-year degree because it was such a rad environment, right? Uh, and then I, I'm I, laughing because uh, I know that story very well, but I went four, I went five for four years. So anyway, go ahead. Yeah, dude. College was great, right? I was no, always there fuck. for the experience. I was never there um, to apply myself in a way. You know, I graduated college or high school with like a 2.0, graduated college with barely skirting by with a 2.0. I was there to meet the people and to have the experiences. And that was just the way that I lived my life. You know, I loved life um, until I didn't. Right. And we'll kind of move Mm. into that uh, later down in the story. Yeah. Um, So uh, once I graduated, I had found uh, a new girlfriend at that time that I thought I was really in love with. You know, I had a had a ring, was going to propose to her. And a week before I was talking to a good friend and I was like, hey, dude, I'm proposing to Amy. This is going to be rad. And he was like, oh, dude, like you can't do that, man. You know? And I'm like, well, why not? He was like, well, she's, she's got a couple other dudes that she's seeing, you know? And I just kind of looked him in the eye and he was like, bro, you can hate me forever. Uh, or it is what it is. Like, I can't let you as a friend do that to yourself, you know? And I just looked him in the eye and I was like, all right, dude, you can help me pack my stuff tomorrow. He was like, I got you, dude. Um, so that was a big trauma in my life because it just totally shifted what I thought I was going to be doing. You know, I had just graduated. I thought I was going to start a family, uh, be a firefighter, all these things were coming online. And then all of a sudden everything shut down, right? It's like, well, what do you do with this? So I did what I knew at the time was change and change is okay. So I had called some buddies up. Hey dude, I need a U-Haul for tomorrow. We're packing all my stuff. I'm getting out of here. There was no questions asked. They were all just right there for me. Cause I'm, was that, was that change because you're, you were okay with change because that's how you were raised. Like you, I think, I think that could have been part of it. It could have been running as well. You know, that fight or flight state (laughs) could be, you know, but I was okay with both. You know, I was, I wasn't really Mm. aware of the nervous system uh, world at that point and the fight or flight effect. Uh, But I was okay with change. So I was like, you know what? Well, I know that it's not going to be better for me to stay here anymore because I've learned that lesson in the past. So let's move on and see what happens, you know, and I was really blessed to have the community around me and have so many amazing people always around me that have always helped me in my journey and showed me a true reflection of myself, if you will. Um, so we literally packed a U-Haul, dude. Never talked to my girlfriend at that time. And I was driving over the Mississippi River, leaving Didn't Illinois. Didn't even say goodbye. Pack, Didn't even say goodbye. I said, beat feet. I, said, I said goodbye to her parents and said, this is what, what's going on. Wow. I, got, I got a roll. And she actually called me when I was cruising over the Mississippi and was like, hey, who you moving? And I was like, oh, like, uh, I just moved out. Like This guy. So I was like, good luck with everything. You know, I don't know what happened and I don't know what's going on, but it is what it is. And I'm rolling Mm. out of here. I didn't know where I was going. I had no idea where I was going. I had always had a dream of living in Colorado. Always had the dream of living on a mountain. Never knew how I was going to get there or what that looked like. But I had that dream, right? So funny enough, about two hours into my road trip to nowhere, um, I was just heading back to my parents' house to drop some stuff off. And a good friend of mine called and uh, he was like, hey, dude, like, I heard you're, uh, you moved out of Illinois. I'm like, I did, dude. I don't know where you heard that, but yeah, I did. And he was like, well, where are you going? And I'm like, bro, I'm not sure. I'm trying to find myself. He was like, well, I just moved to Colorado. I'm going to school in Gunnison, Colorado. I got a place in Crested Butte, Colorado. It's a one road out, one road in, one road out community, town of 1,500 people. And I'm staring at a ski resort from my front deck. And I'm Sold. like, Sold. <laughs> He's like, luckily I got an extra room for rent and we need help with rent right now. I'm like, bro, I'll be there in two days. And I punched it in the Tom Tom. I stopped for one day at my parents and I cruised into Crested Butte, Colorado. That's incredible. I mean, winging a prayer, right? Like it's funny, you know, think, and I have to ask, right? Fast forward just a little bit where, where you are today. Do you look back on things like that and you go, man, things happen for a reason. Are you a things happen for a reason type of guy? I am, dude. I live my life every single moment in that world now because I feel like if anything were to change in the past at all, right, I wouldn't be exactly where I'm at here today, which is there's a purpose to it. And my life is really rad now. My family is incredible. My kids are incredible. My wife is amazing. Um, And I'm stoked. Did you recognize it, though, back then? Oh, absolutely not. No, right. Oh, no, dude. When I rolled into that place, I was so angry and upset. Mm. But I was like, I, I need more. I need to find my true self. 
and I need to tr- like find what makes me happy because I was never able to be alone. You know, if like if I was ever alone, I was calling, I was texting, I was reaching out, trying to find anybody to consume Why? my mind. Why? I think it was that sense of abandonment as a child, right? Like I just mm. didn't want to have that feeling again, you know. And I wasn't aware of that at the time, but I knew it was time to find my own happiness. Um, when that last one had happened, I was like, I'm here in Colorado to find myself. I'll, I'll, I'm on a plan four months, dude, or maybe even just one winter season. I need to find myself. And if these mountains can't find happiness, dude, I don't know what, what can, right? I, I often wonder, right? Like firefighters so often are the type of personalities and people that are always looking out and taking care of others around them. Yeah. And we don't do a good job at taking care of ourselves. And oh, so, dude, it's the worst. And so a lot of times, right, we lose in the shuffle who we actually are and i can tell you at 47 years old i'm only starting to realize this over the last year or two that i need to be good in life to be good for other people in life that's it dude and and i never i never really i i you know listen i've had people ex-girlfriends even my wife at times call me selfish right sometimes you have to be that's um, it. And and I, I think there's a, a good self. I, I just it, your story just resonates so heavily with me because you found that earlier on than I did. Right. Mm-hmm. How old are you now? Uh, I'll turn 37 in September. Yeah. So you got 10 years, man. You got I'm 10 years older than you. And I'm just figuring this shit out now. And yeah, you, know, you had opportunity to really fi- kind of dial in. And, and maybe you didn't know what it looked like back then. But th- those were the, the first steps. Right. In, in yeah. crafting that narrative for yourself. That's it, you know, and I think it always comes down to like, we're here to understand life as best as we can, right? And we're here to experience life and all that it has to offer, you know, and I forget, I think at times we don't understand or deeply enough or see it enough that like we live in a world of duality, you know, and you have to be willing to put yourself in those situations to grow and maybe they aren't the lightest of places, you know, and with our jobs that cultivates automatically almost, right? And it's like, once you understand what deep sadness looks like or deep remorse looks like, like now you can understand the ultimate other side, right? Because there's always the dualistic side of it, you know? So we can stay in that dark side or that victim mentality forever if we choose, or we can understand that there is the other side of that if we want that. It's about how can we become aware enough to cultivate a lifestyle and a community around us to actually see that brighter side and try to live in that state. Wild. It's deep, man. You've had time to think about this. Oh, man. I think it's just the way that I live my life now, and I forget well, how deep it is, you know? Well, and that's it, right? I mean, but I what I love, though, is you're sharing this, right, publicly. You're talking about uh, your story. You're talking about some of the traumas that you had and how you've come out on the other side from it. And, and I think that that's important because to just bounce back a little bit, what I was saying is a lot of guys and, 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 and girls in this job just don't they don't recognize it. Yeah, like it just we we go through the paces where we're too wrapped up in everybody else's things. We're not paying attention to ourselves. We're not taking good care of us. Listen, we could be doing push ups, sit ups, running, jogging, doing Ironman, and be in the most physical best condition of your life. But inside your brain, you might dying. not be so good. You're dying, yeah, dude. And I think that's where you just build. You got to build that narrative that that trauma and give the trauma the voice instead of the voice coming from the trauma that happened to you. Right. So it's like you got to create your own narrative from that and understand that we have that opportunity as first responders, as firefighters, as EMTs, as police officers, whatever that is, that we get to see the dark side every single day, dude. Yeah. Like most people don't get to see that. We get to see the dualistic world every single day. And it's like, what do we want to take out of that to cultivate a more mindful practice for ourselves? I love that. I love that. So Ski bum life. You find yourself uh, two days later, you arrive at the front door at what, Crested Butte? Is that Crest, what you said? Crested Butte, Colorado, it dude. It sounds like a majestic place. It, it is, dude. They called it the last great ski resort in Colorado, and that was true, man. It was There was nothing commercialized in that town when I moved there. It was a town of 1,500. Like, you walk what? into a bar, you know every single person sitting there. What year was that? That was in 2008. Sounds so good, right? It now. was, dude. It, like, it gives me chills to, to yeah. like. It gives me chills to even think about it, you know. And it's like right there in this photo. That's the, that's the Mount Crest of Butte there, and I got engaged mm-hmm. up there, dude. Like, awesome. that yeah. was um, that place taught me everything that I needed to know about myself. And I wow. always said, right? I always said, if I can't be happy here, I need to change something dramatically, and I got to leave this place, right? 
And that's inevitably what happened eight years later. And we'll kind of dive into that a little bit uh, yeah. further down. But but the healing, I mean, so you arrive there and, and now you're you're dialed into your new surroundings, a new lifestyle, if you will, and kind of checked everything outside of Crested Butte, man. Right. This is this is chapter, you know, the next chapter. That's it, man. This is where I want to start finding myself. You know, and yeah. I, I remember my first big goal is I was like, I'm going to go out by myself and I'm going to go find this lake. I had this map out, you know, it was like day two of being there. Our town sits at 9,000 feet, right? So I'm like, even moving into this place, I was so beat up. Just like one load up these stairs and I'm like, oh my God, dude, like, am I that like out of shape? Man, this is crazy, right? Right. So I like opened this map up and I was like, this, this right here, I want to go hit this right here. And my buddy's like, all right, dude, like just drive up this mountain or drive up this road here, park right here and you can make it up there and like, I don't know, probably three hours, but there might be a little snow on the trail. I'm like, dude, I ain't worried about that. I got a bottle of water and a good attitude. Let's roll, right? <laughs> it got intense really quick. About an hour wow. in, it started to be like knee-high snow. And I was so wow. determined. I was only in tennis shoes. I didn't have any any gear. I didn't know what I was getting into. And uh, I went for about two hours more in the snow, just kind of guessing where the trees were a little bit wider than the rest. And I ended up finding a frozen lake, dude. And I remember like taking a photo of it and just being so stoked that I finally did something for myself for the first wow. time without anybody needed to be there to see it, right? Of just being like, dude, you can do hard things, man. You can do hard things and it's going to grow you. And I literally turned around and I ran back down the mountain because my toes were frozen solid at that point, dude. I bet. I bet. And that day changed my life definitely forever, you know? And I was like, all right, man, I'm here. I'm here to find who, who I am and what I'm all about. Like, let's do this thing. I, I don't know, you know, listening to that, it's, um, I'm kind of jealous in a way. Mm. I feel like you, you had a very spiritual moment. Absolutely. Um, and, and I don't, I'm, I'm thinking back, like, I don't have any standout spiritual moments in my life that mm. have, you know, set me on a different path or made me reevaluate, you know, what's in front of me or, or what I've been through. I, I, I haven't had that yet. I'm yeah. hoping I do. I don't know if I need it. I'm sure everybody needs some type of sure. spiritual intervention, if you will. Well, maybe but it's right that, now. It could be. Yeah. It very well could be, right? And that's it comes in all different shapes and sizes. And I think that's kind of, and I'm glad you said that because it kind of leads me to what my point was going to be is that maybe I have had it. Yeah. You know, and, and it just, it's not on a, a majestic or grand scale like yours was in a way, it might've been little things. It might've been a, a car ride that I decided to take the long way home and, and clear my mind or put some thought to something. But people that listen to this podcast, you know, it's important for them to understand that it comes in all different shapes and sizes. That's it. it you know? It's not always going to beat you over the head. That's it. I think the more that we can become aware of our own mm. mind and our own thoughts and our own yes. experiences in life, spiritual moments are literally happening all around us all the time. Us being able to breathe and not think about it is a spiritual moment, right? True. But we can't think of it as such because it's just normal life. And maybe, just maybe we've normalized all the spiritual amazing things that this world has to offer. Mm. You know, it's springtime. The trees are turning green. Flowers are coming up out of nowhere, pushing the mulch up. Like that's amazing. That's spiritual. But we've lost touch with that reality of how cool this world really is. So uh, let me tell you then, you're, damn, I don't feel good right now because well, yesterday was the e eclipse, right? Yeah. And uh, I was like, what's the big deal? Mm. Right? It was such a big deal. I'm watching the news last night and the, the weathermen from different stations are like almost in tears talking yeah. about this moment, right? The, the totality of it, right? And I'm like, what? Come on. It, it, it's like, it's cool. I looked through the glasses once or twice. You know, yesterday I was on the road, but I pulled over to get gas and I jumped out of the truck. I had the glasses on the front seat. I looked up. I'm like, that's pretty cool. We're at 80% coverage where I was. Maybe I should have taken an extra minute. Yeah. You know, I wonder. I wonder. I think now. we all can, right? Because mm. we're here to experience, you know, and we're here to experience with other people. That's like why I believe, I really believe that we're on this planet to feel all the feels. And until you're fully aware of that and in tune enough with our bodies, which unfortunately with trauma, we come out of body and we don't really feel a whole lot anymore. Yeah. Um, but until you come really in tune with your body and in tune with your surroundings, like everything is majestic and magical. And you can see it in a child's eyes. Like th that dude's living on heaven on earth and he's in right next to me. What am I not seeing here, dude? You know, and sometimes I think as a parent, we can just get down to our children's level and see what they're seeing 
and realize like, whoa, dude, it's been here what all is, along. What is that though? Why, why can't I? I think it's based off our beliefs and habits and limited beliefs more than anything because most of our beliefs of our world come into existence between the age of like three and eight years old, right? So the, the voice in our head that's always repeating what we think we know, right, is from a child, a child's perspective that was put on them based on their environment in that moment, based on their parents, their grandparents, their churches, whatever that looked like. And we have to be willing as adults to question those beliefs every day. Mm -hmm. Like, is this, is this limiting my life now that I have this belief? Is it bettering my life? Can I get rid of this thing, dude? You know, and I spent probably about two and a half years ago now, I spent about a year and a half questioning every single thing that I thought I knew. Yeah. And I got rid of about 98% of the way I live my life, wow. which is bizarre because I lived a oh. pretty cool life. But that Laird event and the line of duty death yeah. allowed me to really open up into that experience of like, dude, I don't, I don't know how long I have, right? Like time is the only thing besides change that we know. Like it's our time is going to be where we're not going to be here any longer. What are we going to do with this time? And do we have a sense of urgency of I want to change the world and impact it the most that I possibly can while I'm here in order for my family and my kids to be able to enjoy this beautiful world for what it is instead of what we think we want to tell them. It's beautiful, man. And you know, I, I just I'm sitting here listening and I'm just taking it in because I I need to do a little bit better on a couple things in my own life. I know that, mm. you know, and. And being open minded, I'm more open minded than I've ever been. And I'm, you know, talking with guys like you on the regular, different guys that bring to so much different perspective and points of view. And I've never been this open to other people's thoughts and ideas and questioning the status quo or what you yeah. think you know and and so on. And so it's not easy to let go a little bit. You gotta no. let you gotta release some of that control. You gotta be able to turn it off a little bit or be willing to at least give a little, leave a little bit on the table to see what else is out there. Yeah. Right. And I think that all comes through what I learned in the Academy, which I'm so blessed for when I went through of how regimented it was and how disciplined it was and how military like it was by the leaders that were there at the time. And they always said like, we're here to teach you how to be comfortable in an uncomfortable environment. And I'm like, mm -hmm. That just seems silly, dude. Like, I'm in a lot of pain. I'm never going to be comfortable with this. This sucks. And I remember the day that it happened in the academy to where I was so miserable in Firefighter 1 class that I literally just, like, felt everything in my body, and I just started giggling. I was like, dude, like, I'm there. I feel so comfortable because it's, I'm just so used to it now, right? And I learned so much by that that now I always feel like I choose the hard path because I know that's the right path, right? And that's about the discipline and the integrity. And that's why I do what I do now. And that's why I ice bath every day, right? And that's why I do my yoga. It's really hard, but it's cultivating. Like I want to always do hard things to better my life and to make it more of an experience that actually I can be like, dude, that moment right there was so wicked, but that changed me forever, dude. It's wild. I, I just listened to a conversation the other day. I think it might've been another podcast I was listening to where they talked about choosing the hard path and, yeah. and that when you take the easy way about it, once you let that easiness settle in, it's very hard to get rid of it. That's it. Right? it it's so when you challenge yourself daily, hourly challenge yourself, you create a, a level of understanding on a whole different level. That's it. That's it. And that, and that challenge, picking that hard road, makes you better. It makes you stronger. Yes. It gives you more insight, intellect, like all of it. And I was sitting there listening to that conversation, and I'm thinking about myself, and I'm like, yeah, I need to make some changes for sure. You know, I can blame the schedule. I can blame how busy I am, the amount of travel I do. And so all those other choices then that accompany that, I could, I could change it. But you get very uncomfortable really quickly when it's harder. That's right, you know, and I think the comfort zone is where dreams go to die, period, yes. period, dude. The comfort zone is where dreams go to die. That's the bottom line, and once you understand that, it's like, well, I want to dream big, dude, like this vision that I have in my life. This is my dream right here. I'm awake to it. I shouldn't matter if I'm sleeping or awake. It should be the same sweet dream that I'm trying to cultivate, you know, and the more that you choose the hard road, the more that you'll learn about yourself and the more that you'll grow to all of a sudden what you thought was completely impossible is now your baseline of living, right? And I think that was through a lot of the practices that I chose 
and a lot of the events that I chose to sign up for that when I signed up for them, I was like, there's no way I can finish this right now. But I mm. think those dudes know something that I don't. And I want to know what that is. Right. So that, so that spiritual moment on that lake. Yeah. Stand there, you snap that picture, and now you're like, man, I got frostbite on my feet. I got to get the hell out of here. Yeah, big time. Sprint down that mountain. Reality check, right? <clears throat> when you got back to your car. Yeah. And you sat in there and turned the heat on, and you had a second to thaw out. What yeah. was going through your mind? Oh, man. I'm was sure there I... this sense of accomplishment? Just Absolutely. Independence, like all of it, just overwhelming? I think it was a level of like, it gives me chills right now to even think about it. Um, yeah. It was just a level of like a high level of stoke, right? It was like, wow, dude, like I'm here. Like I always knew I was going to live on a ski resort. And if I would have knew how I was going to get there, I would have quit right away. I'd have been like, absolutely not, dude. I will not sign up for that. I'll be fine without the ski resort dream, dude. Like, leave it alone, you know? And, you know, and I feel like God will never give you the answers of like how you're going to get to where you're going to get to, but he'll show you the way, right? You just have to have trust and have faith in something that's so much bigger than us, whatever you believe in, you know, it doesn't matter. Like you need to have faith in a higher power to understand that you're exactly where you're at right now in your journey of where you're supposed to be. And what do you want to do with that? You know? And I think when I got back, it was like a big sense of relief. And a big sense of like, dude, I'm proud of you. Like I had to like speak to myself. Like I'm proud of you for making this move, dude. You did this to better yourself against yeah. all odds, you know, because yeah. I had been through relationships where I went back to the same girl over and over and over in high school. We all have, right? And it we crushed me, dude. And I was yeah. like, I'm not going to do that again. So instead I'm going to pack up without even telling her and I'm going to roll out so I don't get stuck in that pattern. Right. And it's all about seeing the patterns that we're constantly stuck in and choosing the other side, knowing because you have to learn by your experiences. You have to learn and reflect by things you did wrong. And you have to acknowledge that and then reflect upon it and change it, right? And choose the other path. That's awesome. There's so much there because there's no way you, through clarity, through experience comes this mindset of yours. Right? Yeah. And so let's fast forward a little bit from, from that country life, that, that mountain life that you were living. How did you find yourself to Frederick County, Maryland? Like, yeah, what, wild. How did um, you get there? Because that's where I think things really, you know, through the, the line of duty death that you were involved with, with Josh Laird, Captain Josh Laird, and so on that we, we're going to talk about. But that's really where I have to think you then uh, took that trauma and built off all that experience that you started to find for yourself from that Colorado journey forward. Yeah, I think so, you know, and I had eight years in Colorado, right? I planned on four months, stayed eight years. It's kind of the way it rolls, <laughs> right? Uh, and it was cool, dude. I started in as a lift operator on the ski resort. So I had 90 people that we used to go party with in the locker room every night, really. And just, it was like being a freshman in college again, right? Everybody yeah. was there to find themselves. And we had yeah. the most radical place to do that, right? It was like, we called it Never Never Land. And that's truly what it was, you know? And I kind of worked my way up through the ski resort I did lift operations, and then I was a supervisor running some lifts and managing some people. And then I started snowmobiling, and I witnessed um, – I came upon an avalanche of a death, and the guy was buried down, and all of his friends had just pulled him out. And I remember just, like, seeing the grief on these these gentlemen's face of just being like, our friend's dead, dude. Like, And I'm like, well, I've been sledding all year. Like, how did that even happen? That dude was buried from a, a little small avalanche like that? Like, oh, man, I need to – all right, dude, like reality check, right? I need to learn about avalanche. Okay, what are you going to do that? I was like, well, I'm going to, because I had let everything lapse at this point, right? My fire one, my EMT, I let it all lapse. And I was like, I'm going to go back, get my EMT cert, and I'm going to get on with ski patrol. Those dudes are the best of the best. We have the most lift accessible extreme terrain in North America. Those dudes do avalanche work every day. I want to learn from them. Cool, let's do that. So then I took that, that just that one step that I knew, go get certified as an EMT again, right? So I did that, and then I got on with Ski Patrol and started learning about all that process, and it was a wild ride, dude. You know, I wasn't a skier. I was a snowboarder. I was a great snowmobiler, so they, they actually hired me for my snowmobile skills, um, and I was very blessed for that. But I got caught in a little avalanche, and it freaked me out. I was making like 12 bucks an hour, and I was like, dude, like, I don't think I'm getting anything out of this. Let's move on, right? So I did a little bike patrol and getting paid to mountain bike around and be an EMT, which was super rad. And I was able to work on trails that I was going to ride on my days off. Like, hold on, you're right. going to pay me to ride yeah. my bike and work on a trail that I'm going to ride tomorrow on my day off? Like, done. Let's hook, sign me up, dude, right? 
Um, so then I worked all the way through that. And then I ended up working at the ER uh, in the base area as a tech because those dudes were the best of the best in trauma. And I wanted to learn sure. everything that they knew about trauma of the body. And I wanted to cultivate that environment for myself to be able to bring that to my family when that time came through, right? So that's when kind of everything shifted. I started doing EMT work on my dirt bike, which was a dream of mine. I'm like, again, these dudes are going to pay me to ride my dirt bike in the middle of the mountains and put band-aids on people. Like this is wow. amazing, right? Yeah. So that's yeah. kind of where my first big trauma occurred. I was working, it was called the Big Mountain Enduro. It was a professional bike race in Colorado in Crested Butte. And it was the best of the best of the whole world that were there to race this race. And um, I was on my dirt bike, went to the middle of the mountains. I'm 20 some miles out from the road, right? And laying in a hammock, drinking a Mountain Dew, got my shoes off, watching these racers fly by, just having a dream world. And somebody came down and they're like, hey man, I think somebody's doing CPR on the trail. I don't know what happened. And I'm like, wait, what? You know, so I called it on the radio. Yeah. I put my boots on. I start my <clears> bike <throat> up and I'm wide open going down a single, single track as pro racers are coming right at me. Right. So I'm like trying to avoid these dudes who have traveled the whole world to do this one race. And yeah. I'm trying to avoid them. And I get on scene of this guy who ended up being the dude's best friend um, doing CPR on him. So it was pretty intense at that time because I was solo. I was a pretty newish EMT at that point, a few years in. Um, but I hadn't been solo on something like that for a while, sure. you know, and being, I was like, he was right in a place where I couldn't get him off the trail far enough to be out of the way. So I was trying to shut the race down and stop dropping because they were dropping every minute from literally, they were dropping from 11,000 feet at the top of a mountain and cruising wow. down this trail, right? So they finally stopped it after I got hit a couple of times, ran over a couple of times while doing compressions. You know, my suction, I literally had a 60 cc syringe and I'm using the suction this guy. I'm trying to use his friend here as best as I can. Um, and then finally these racers started to gather around and be like, what can we do to help? How can we help? And I, I, I had such a hard time of letting go and like using them as resources, yes. right? Because every mm -hmm. time somebody would try to bag this guy, I <clears> knew he wasn't getting the right amount of breath or the good yep. seal there. So I was going in between CPR and then I was going back into the breathing and I was switching off and I was having these guys, I'm like, just make me some kind of gurney so we can get him to the helicopter landing zone, right? These dudes, it was the most incredible thing. Like they came together and they literally took all their backpacks off. They cut all their bike tubes in half and they had used sticks, put their backpacks together and then weaved everything together and literally made a gurney that we put this gentleman on and we were working him all the way to the helicopter landing pad, right? So we ended up working this guy. I think I was on scene solo for about 35 minutes doing CPR on this guy before they landed the helicopter and finally pronounced him for... Ch uh, trauma to the chest and it was pretty devastating to me but I didn't acknowledge it at all you know I like I was like dude that really sucks all right man like let's get out of here I like got on my dirt bike and I rode home and I met my wife and some friends at a bar and had a margarita and then I went to bed like it was it was what it was you know and the next day they ended up calling the whole race they canceled the whole race and they had a memorial ride and I was like I'm not I can't be part of that I can't be part of the ride I'm good. You know, I couldn't get out of bed the next day because I was so sore and my whole body was just locked sure. up, you know? Yeah. And then that's when things started to change for me, you know? And that's when all of a sudden the world that I thought was so beautiful and amazing and radical started to become not so fun. And I started to find myself more sheltered and I started to find myself looking at all the negative things in life. And I didn't understand that, you know? And I remember my friends coming to me and being like, dude, you're so negative. And I'm like, no, I'm not, dude. Like, I'm just letting you know this guy's an idiot. And that's stupid. They should be changing this. And I was just pointing out facts that I thought were correct, right? And it got to that point to where um, my wife was pregnant with our second child at that point. And we, we we weren't really living that ski bum lifestyle anymore, right? Like, we used to have four months off where we'd go whitewater raft for two months. Or we'd go to Moab and go mountain biking for a few months. And once we didn't have a sitter, and once we didn't have help with that family um, camaraderie, if you will... And I was just finding myself unhappy. Like I had already made that rule eight years ago. Like when I'm not happy here anymore, something needs to change dramatically and I need to leave Got this it. place. And I was there, right? And I knew that. Um, so at that point we knew, I was like, all right, I'm going to put in for a, a full-time fire job because I was a part-time firefighter in Glenwood Springs, Colorado during all of that as well as working in the ER. And I wasn't really parenting my child with my wife. And I really wanted that. She was working night shifts. I was working day shifts. 
it was the whole handoff situation. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. all right, babe, let's make it, let's make a shift. So I put in for Grand Junction, Colorado, and I put in for Frederick, Maryland, you know, and I was like, whatever, whatever way we go, whatever job we get, let's go that direction. We're like, all right, plan, deal, done. So I started the process with Frederick and um, I was flying, I had to drive five hours to Denver airport and then get on a four hour flight and then an hour to Frederick just to do a, a one test, right? So I did that like four different times to get on here. And I ended up not getting the conditional offer until the day that we left. Cause finally it got to a point where it just kept being put off and put off. And I was like, babe, what do you want to do? You want to just, should we roll? We got to roll, right? She's like, let's roll. And we decided that. And that day in the, in the letter in the mail came, it was like, you were accepted. Um, so it all worked out. Right. So I ended up driving cross country here and um, it was like six days before the Academy started. And I didn't really like, I was like, all right, let's jump in, dude. Moved into the in-laws basement, basically, you know, we're just moving in. We're going to be fine. Our next child's coming in six months. It's no, everything's going to be great. Didn't really think about it. And then I got here and then I was, I was devastated. You know, I was yeah. like, when I landed, stepped foot on this place, I was like, my dream's over. Mm. It's over. The dream that I had to live in Colorado. Why did I just leave that dude? Now I'm living at my in-laws house with my two-year-old son and my pregnant wife. Like when the hell did this happen, dude? What are you doing, bro? And I started questioning yeah. everything. Right. Did, did that, that trauma on the trail, the one, that first big trauma for you, right. Um, it sounds like you didn't really deal with it ever. Not at all. And, and from, from there, things kind of turned. It, it did, sounds. you know, and the only thing that I knew I wanted was I wanted to have the experience that he had. Uh, Will uh, was the man who passed away when he died. So about a week before I moved, I called my buddy and I was like, hey, Ben, can you take me on that trail? Can you take me on the full ride? Uh, of Had you not been back up there since that? Right? I hadn't. No, I've been on there wow. on a dirt bike once, but I've never experienced it on a bike because it was a it was a pretty gnarly ride. And okay. He's like, yeah, dude, where do you want to park? I was like, I want to leave from my house. He was like, bro, like, that's crazy. I'm like, sick, let's do it. Like, that's what I want. He was like, I got you, son. Like, I got you. So we left it. Like walking, just like walking with tennis sneakers three miles into the woods to find a lake. That's it, dude, right? So yeah. like, so we ended up leaving at 4 o'clock in the morning, and we did, I want to say it was 50, oof, I think it was 5,600 vertical feet that we climbed, and wow. like it was like a 38-mile mountain bike ride. Where, I mean, I was so miserable getting to the peak that I didn't even know if I can hike a bike anymore at all. Mm. And when I dropped into that face of that mountain, dude, and I got to experience what he was experiencing what I, in my own perception, it was such a blessing to me to know that he went out in such a radical way, right? I was like, wow, dude. And I remember coming into the zone and the little chicane that you had to do on the bike. And like the dirt was so perfect and it had just rained and it was magical. Right. And I remember coming into that chicane where he hit that tree and like feeling his body, like almost just being like, this was it, dude. Like this was the last thing that this man ever saw. Now I'm experiencing it as myself as alive. Like this is incredible. But that was the only thing that I would say I did to overcome that trauma, which I think was more than most and more than I ever done before. Um, but I wasn't aware of what I was doing. I was just doing it cause it felt like that's what I needed to do. Yeah. You know, but you followed your instinct. I followed right? my intuition. Like, <clears throat> you know, you, if you had moved to Frederick and not had that experience six days prior yeah, or, or whatever it was prior, you know, it could have been a whole different story for you. That's it, man. And I think that's something I've really been pretty good at is I've always went with my gut and I've always went with what I felt what was right for me, you know, and some people yeah. might be like, well, that's selfish, you know, and it's like, I feel like I have to feel my own tank if I want to mm -hmm. help anybody else feel their tanks. And there's so many times where we don't do that. You know, and I like to like talk to people in that sense of like, dude, if you find yourself like in a parking lot and you start jumping all the cars around you without every now and then running around the block and charging your own battery, at some point, everybody's going to be gone and you're going to be stuck in that parking lot yeah. with no fuel and no battery and no help. Yeah. Like you have to take care of yourself and you can call it selfish if you want, but I know that I'm just feeling myself up to give more to overflow the love that I have for this world into everybody else as much as I can. Well, and that's what I was saying before. I couldn't agree with you more. And I think that's why you and I clicked from the second we met a couple of weeks ago 
you know, it, this resonated with me. This, you know, your the way about you, your approach, the conversation we had. We spoke for what three, four minutes. Yeah. And I was like, man, I want to, I want to learn more about this guy. We were vibing. You know? We were. Yeah. And and I think that you know because we share a lot of similarities in what our thought processes are, and I I believe that I've come to realize that I need to be good, and whatever it takes for me to be good will then allow me to be good for everyone else in my life. But if I'm crumbling personally. I can't, I'm not who I can be for everybody else. That's and, it. Uh, if I have to be the rock for everyone else, then I need to be a rock for myself too. That's it. I think that's so hard sometimes to cultivate because we live in a society that tells you to do the opposite, you know? That's right. That's right. So you got to go against, you got to do the hard path. And that's always the yeah. right way is the hard path is always the way you need to go. And speaking of the hard path, you get to Frederick, you're doing a hard path. I mean, you're living in yeah. your in-laws basement. You're going to start a fire academy. That fire academy is not a, an easy process. Oh, I know bro. the guys there. I know that academy. It's yeah. probably one of the hardest academies in the, in the country. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's, it's a tough program. It is, you know, and we went to family night with my wife and I, and I remember like right when Lenny Stolberg, who's now our chief of special operations, uh, started speaking, I immediately was like, Oh no, like what did I get myself into, dude? This is this is gonna be really, <laughs> really get, way more I intense. Get back to the mountains, yeah. Yeah, because my academy in Colorado part time job was like, let's get some pizza, we'll talk about a few things, you know, and that was my mentality. So the right. second that that switched like an instinct, I was like, All right, like I'm here, I'm locked in. There's no other way out. Right. There's no way right. out at this point, right? And I remember coming home from my first day of the academy. I was sore from literally just shaking in fear all day long, all day. And I walked into the door and I remember my wife looked at me in the eyes and she just goes, Oh no. Like, are you, are you going to make it through this? Are you going to be okay? And I'm like, babe, there's no other option. There's no other option. That's the bottom line. Right. And at that point I was like, I've moved my family. I've literally moved across the entire yeah. country for my dream job. I always knew I'd be a full-time firefighter. I didn't good. I didn't know how that was going to happen. Right. And here I am. What am I going to do with this opportunity and how much am I going to apply myself in order to be great, to show my kids that this is possible, that anything in the world that you want and dream of is at the tip of your fingers and how much, how much work are you willing to put in, right? I think that's really important to understand. It is. And, you know, you went from in your life looking out for yourself and taking care of yourself to now a wife and two children. Yeah, that's and it, so dude. The- the responsibility grew, you know, uh, threefold, there, you know, fourfold. There wasn't even an option, right? And I think you got to right. ask yourself, like, where is the I quit level? Like, where is that mm. level? You know, and who's counting on you to make this happen? And what am I willing to sacrifice? Period. I think that's a hard conversation for a lot of people. I agree. And it, it certainly looks different for everyone. I mean, people have different thresholds of pain. People have different thresholds of uncomfort, you know, uncomfortability, like all of it. Yeah. That's a hard one to focus in on. But what I can tell you as a father myself and a husband is that I've come to realize that I sacrifice more for them than I do for myself. 100%. Yeah. 100%. And you have to be willing to sacrifice at least a little bit in order to grow, right? And you have to be Mm -hmm. willing to sacrifice something to have skin in the game. You have to have skin in the game. Otherwise, you're not going to show up for yourself, you know, and you need to commit. And commitment is doing something all the way through that you said you were going to do, even though the, the moment and the mood passed of when you said it, right? It's so mm. important to understand that. Like, I committed to this. I'm going to apply myself. I'm not a great student. I only have two options. If I tie a, ni- a knot wrong and I skip and I fail one test, I'm out. I'm out. And then what? You know, and I'm proud to say that I pushed through to a limit that I've never, never even came close to at that moment in pain threshold. And I graduate as a valedictorian with like a 94%. And this is coming from somebody who had 2.0 in high school and barely made it after calling the assistant fire chief of my volunteer department to change my grade to, to graduate with a 2.0 in college, right? So like I once I pro- proved it to myself, like, dude, you're capable. You can do hard things. You can go through these times and grow exponentially while teaching your children like the possibilities of the world. Like, let's do it, dude. Game on wild 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 it makes sense it absolutely makes sense you were finding this process really led you to find who you are yeah and then and then you get on the job yeah i mean go through the academy and now you're you're in the firehouse and you're living your best life yeah and i think reverse real quick i think we find ourselves in times of adversity 
that's where we oh, ultimately 100%. find ourselves. And once we come to terms with that, and understand that deeply, like we're going to grow exponentially quickly because we don't have to sit in that grief and that BS for so long. Once we understand, all right, dude, why am I here? You know, maybe I need to zoom out a little bit on my life and be like, all right, I'm in a little lull here and I can focus in on that as much as I want. And I'm not going to get out until I zoom out and be like, all right, let's look at the scale of this in a couple year timeline and realize, hey, dude, I'm still growing. I'm just in a little lull and let, let's go, dude. Roller coaster would be really boring if it was just flat. Like a That's roller right. coaster is up and down because it makes life rad, dude. It is what it is. All right. So diving into <laughs> out of the academy. I, I, yes. Yeah, absolutely. So it was interesting because I feel like there's a standard at the academy, right? I feel like it's very regiment. It's very strict. This is the expectation. If you don't meet it, you're out, right? Right. And then you get out on the field and you realize that that standard doesn't, it's, it doesn't live there. You know, it doesn't live there at all. And it can be a little bit disheartening. And you can find yourself, depending on what shift you're on, what firehouse you're on, how busy you are, and you can find yourself in that recliner very easy. And you can find yourself mm -hmm. looking at all the negative really easy, and you lose that standard, you know? And I think as I've grown as a firefighter, you start to realize that the standard is in place as baseline. Like I'm never going to only be standard for the most part. I'm always going to try to go above the standard, and that's just who I am. And we it as goes in the hard route. That's it, dude. But we as firefighters are in charge of the standard as well. Are you that's right. even though these guys aren't meeting the standard and these dudes aren't meeting the standard? Are you meeting the standard? Are you bringing the standard to the table every single day or not? Or are you going to lower yourself down to the level that you think is okay? You know. And I found myself there after a few years, um, and I had that roller coaster ride of like, what am I doing here? You know. Um, after like four years, the first few years I was in heaven, right? I was loving life. I was in a busy station. I was downtown Frederick, Maryland, running all the calls. My first shift was 16 hours after my second child was born. Wow. Right. So yeah. I was actually visiting my son and my wife in the hospital as I was bringing patients. And I ran 22 calls that day. Oh my gosh. So it was wild. It was a wild ride, but it was my dream world. I'm working my dream job now at a busy station downtown and I'm getting to visit my son and my wife in the hospital, my, my new baby. This is incredible, right? And then I started running some of the harder calls and some of the more traumatic calls that I didn't know how much they were affecting my life, right? Because mm. then I found myself back in that state of just unhappiness, unworthiness, finding all the negativity and everything, you know? And again, I had another spiritual event, we'll call it. This was probably about three or four years ago now. I have the date written down in a journal. Um, but I ran a call, um, OB call about 3 a.m. And I got on scene and there was uh, a mother laying there on the bed and there was just a little little arm sticking out of her. It was She was 26 weeks pregnant. And I remember just like, trying to get this hand to react to my fingers like a normal baby would, right? Because it was an actual sure. hand. It was a small one. And just like trying everything I can. I had a rookie that had only been on for like three or four weeks, I believe, at this point. And I was like just doing what I knew as an EMT. And thankfully, our medic was super rad at that time and showed up on scene. And I'm like trying to help this lady like maybe push or not push. I don't know. Like was able to cultivate um, more of an environment of like, all right, let's load and roll, right? So I went home after that and I never really thought a whole lot about it. I went to sleep back at the firehouse and the next day I was with my family and I was washing my kid's hands, my two-year-old at that moment. And I remember washing his hands and just being like, I had all these flashbacks. It was like a full blown panic attack, which I've never had. I don't believe. And I started seeing all of these calls that I've ran, but I started seeing them in my own family's life. Right. And it was, it was a day that changed me forever, I'll say, because that, right. that day right there was the day that I made a promise to myself that I would start cultivating a mindful life, right? Because I wasn't, when I looked at his hands, I looked at my hands and I'm like, what are these hands doing right now? Are these like, are these building a world and an environment and cultivating a world for your family of growth and love and happiness and strength? Or are they doing things that are harming me? Are they doing things in bad habits and bad beliefs and bad limited thought patterns what am I doing right now? And I questioned everything again. All right, dude, it's time to question everything. And that's when I went into the world of like, where do these beliefs of mine come from? 
Why am I finding myself in these negative patterns and how can I overcome them? Right. So that call really changed my life forever. And again, I had no idea of, of any of this world at that moment besides I need a change because I have everything that I want in life that I ever dreamed of, the home, the family, the dog, the pets, but I'm unhappy. I'm not happy. Yeah. You're recognizing that pattern. Again. Yeah. It's like, why mm -hmm. am I not happy when I have everything right. I said that I needed to be happy? And here's the problem now is you just can't pick up and go. That's it. I can't just run away anymore. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So it's like, all right, dude, let's sit in it for a little bit and see what it's all about. What do you have to teach me here in dark times? Right. I'll tell you, I'm I'm so intrigued and impressed by you right now because I don't know how many people, you know, you said the easy way. The easy way would have been to spiral and become somebody you didn't want to be yeah. because it was just easier to be that way. But you're willing to face this thing head on because you recognize the patterns. Well, I think it's important, right? And I think not having a father growing up, I wanted to be the best dad that I possibly could be, sure. right? And I knew that. I didn't understand how I was going to cultivate that until I did a mm. lot of healing with my own father to understand like everything that I thought I didn't have that he didn't give me. He actually taught me all of the lessons by not doing that. He literally taught me all of the lessons I needed in life to become the best father that I possibly can be, you know? And until you can change that narrative and change that story of like, I was just a little kid and I'm a victim. It's like, well, right. no, what is there here to learn from this? Right. It's what you do with it. It's what I do with it. That's it. Yeah. So that's when I started yeah. the journey of like, all right, dude, I'm going to start doing hard things. I'm going to start doing things for myself. Um, I started doing, I, I wanted to learn how to swim. I wasn't a very good swimmer. And for mm. whatever reason, I was like, I'm going to learn how to do swimming in the pool. And I want to sign up for a sprint triathlon. It's like, sweet, let's do that. And during that process, I got a coach for like a hundred bucks for three sessions. She taught, she was this hippie lady, super rad, taught me everything. I was like, she just taught me everything I need to know. Like, let's do this. Right. And my wife got me a 10 day pass to a yoga more here in Frederick, Maryland to do yoga. And I'm like, yoga, like for real. She's yeah. like, I don't know, babe, just try it out. Like whatever works. Right. Cause at this point I'm like trying counseling and trying all these other means of like how to cultivate a more positive environment in my mind. And then I found yoga and yoga really changed my life dramatically more than I can ever even imagine. Truthfully, uh, we found a new church to start going to and, and building a new community around us. And then I started doing things like things I couldn't think I would do, like a triathlon, right? And I remember finishing my first triathlon. It was about two or three months after I started that swim. And it was just a sprint. So the whole race is like an hour and a half. And we did it at Smith Mountain Lake in Virginia. And I remember finishing that and being like, that's rowdy. Like, that was really hard. Like, mm. what do these dudes do in the Ironman? Like, how is that even possible? Dude, like, it's not, it's not even possible, bro. That's insane. Like, I don't even understand that at all. I need to figure out what those guys got going on, right? So as I started to evolve, it was about a year into, like, really just finding all of these things that were fueling my body, fueling my life, fueling my energetic body, of like, what's giving me happiness? Am I volunteering? Am I serving? Right? Because we're here to be servants, I believe. And I think that's one of my favorite things about being a parent is like being a servant to a small child. Like, that's all you are. You're a servant, right? We're here to be servants. As a firefighter, you're a public servant. As a father, you're a servant to your children. We need to recognize that. And like, what are you trying to do as service? What are you bringing to the table to change these people's lives? Right? Yeah. It might not mm -hmm. be for us. Like we get these calls every day. This person called 911. It's the worst day in their life. We need to remember right. that. We got to remember That's that right. and we can lose that really quickly. Right. Yeah. So I started to really cultivate that mindset of like, why am I here? What am I here to learn? Why am I here? What am I here to learn? What can I get rid of? It no longer serves me. Right. And everything in my life I was bringing into this practice and I was getting rid of old beliefs and bringing on new beliefs. And I started meditating uh, which completely changed my life as well. And I do it every single day now because it brings me present into my own body and my own thoughts and my mind and then just relax into it, you know, and understand it and become aware of it without judgment is so important, right? What What is that, if you don't mind me asking, what does that look like for you? Because I think people get this, they conjure up these images of what meditation is and it's, uh, you know, um, you know. And for me, like my wife introduced me to the Calm app. Yeah. And I was doing sleep stories every night. And that was a form of meditation for me where I could turn off the world, yep. listen to a sleep story, and really be able to, to train myself to unwind and fall asleep. And then in the morning, 
she would meditate with the Calm app again and listen to different meditations. And I find myself enjoying it. Yeah. I just don't do it regularly. Yeah. Because I'm usually up early. I'm, I'm running around already. But I can really see the value in that. I'm just curious what that is for you. Yeah. So for me now, it's definitely the um for sure. Every morning I got to give it to me. Uh, but it came through like a sense of running, right? Because mindfulness mm. is basically just paying attention on purpose without judgment, right? So anything that you can do to cultivate just like presentness and becoming aware of your breath and your body of where you're at instead of being anxious for the future or depressed because of the past, I want to be right now, right here. If I can focus on my breathing and just count my breaths, I know I'm present. I'm in a presence t- tense. And then if things start coming into my mind, I can be aware of what's coming in my mind because a lot of times – we let this thing run our daily lives, our subconscious mind. I mean, we can run at a 98% level without even thinking about life. Like you get in your car and you drive to work and you don't even think about it. And all of a sudden yeah, you're, you're like, how did I mm-hmm. get here? It's just a program. And sometimes our programs are no longer serving our highest selves and our selves of growth, right? So I think anything that you can do that cultivates a sense of mindfulness, that's why yoga I think was so imperative for me was it brings you into your body and your breath because it's really difficult. Like it's a hard thing to do. And when you have a 110 pound girl next to you doing something that you can't even think about doing, it's like frustrating as a male, right? You're like, (laughs) all right, like I want to come in here and be the best at this. And it's not going to happen. You got to feel your body. You got to breathe into it in order to overcome, you know, and that yoga brought in a lot of that mindfulness to where like, Meditation is a non-negotiable anymore. I do it every day. And if I can't have, if I don't have the 15, 20 minutes to sit down, then I'll go for a walk and I'll make sure that like I have no phone, I have no distractions and I'm just in the moment. I'm looking at the trees. I'm looking at the flowers. I'm looking at anything that's present in my life. That's going to give me gratitude, you know? And I think cultivating gratitude in this world is so important because it opens up our heart to actually see what the world has to offer. All of this is just, uh, I love everything about it. And I'm also drawing parallels too, between like you were talking about the fire Academy and then having that day where you just broke down and giggled because it was yeah. like, it all just clicked, right? It all, you got to a place where you, you knew you couldn't control it anymore. And so it, it puts you in this place of Zen now, right? It's the same with it's all it. of this, right? It's yeah. And I love that. I think, uh, you know, we talk about firefighting, you know, you got to be comfortable with being uncomfortable, right? But there is truth to that. Well, I think you know, there's like, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no. And I was just going to say that that goes throughout life. Yeah. Right. So we talk about it in the fire service being in situations that get pretty hairy and we need to be, we need to get ourselves in a place where we know we can get through that and, and, and so on. But also in life is keep keeping a, a consistent diet of uncomfortableness yeah. and adversity, as you said earlier, right? These are things that will create a, an environment for us to, to succeed, to come out on the other end. Yeah, hundred percent, you know, and I think pain is inevitable and suffering is a choice, right? Like pain is what pushes us to growth, right? And like the more that you can control the controllables and put yourself in those really uncomfortable environments, the more comfortable you get in those environments. Guess what? It's not comfortable getting into an ice bath, but when I know first thing in the morning that I'm going to get into an ice bath and choose the hard route, then I have to become aware of my subconscious mind that's programmed and be like, Hey dude, I see you. I see you telling me not to do this. And I'm going to go against you anyways, because it's good for me and it's good for my body. and It's good for my well being. When I come out of that ice bath, you're a whole new person because you've now you've seen the pain of your mind and you've like, you became aware of it. And the second that you become aware of that pain and that negative voice, you take the power away from it. You literally strip the power away from that negative voice the second that you become aware of it, you know? A hundred percent. Yeah. It's awesome. It's awesome. Yeah. So take me down this road then, um, in the firehouse, talk to me a little bit about maybe, uh, maybe the Josh Laird line of duty. Sure. Yeah. What that has done. Yeah. So the line of duty death happened. I think at that point I was, um, I had done like one more triathlon. I was doing a lot of yoga, then a lot of meditation and just like, trying to find the happiness within. And I was on a pretty sweet journey, right? And I was like, oh, yeah. don't let the external world like dictate your internal world. And like kind of in this woo woo time of life, you know? And uh, the night before the Josh Laird event, I got offered 
free tickets to a fish show. I've never even really listened to a fish concert, but I knew all my hippie friends in Colorado loved them. And I was like, dude, oh, yeah, I've seen fish uh, a ton. Yeah. And in fact, Trey Anastasio's, uh, uh, I guess it was nephew, uh, Dave Anastasio. I sublet his apartment in college. No so way. Dave. Sick. Yeah. Yeah. Really. Yeah, absolutely. So very cool. I know fish very much yeah. from, my, from my time. Yeah. So it was pretty wild and it was beautiful because I have that photo of that night. But my wife and I got these tickets to Hershey Park and I went up there. It was the day before shift and we had a ball. Like this big storm ran in, dude, and we had all this rain clouds and dumping on us. Had a couple beers for the show and then just like shook our bodies in this like wild way. Because I feel like a fish environment gives you that opportunity just to be awesome. weird. You know, awesome. like nobody's judging you. Like just be weird, Not dude. There. Just shake your body. <laughs> However, it feels like it needs to be, right? Yeah. And I had yeah. this photo with my wife, and I love it because it was the day before that event. And I was like, this could have been our last photo ever taken together, right? And that was, that was hard. That was like, whew, that was a deep one for me. Um, so I, we came back. It was pretty late that night. And I got back on shift the next morning, and I was on the front ambulance at Station 3 downtown in Frederick. Busy ambulance, right? And um, I was on the phone with my friend. Um, talking about just the world we live in and how crazy it's getting and how much opportunity we have to still have these incredible moments like that fish show that people gave us tickets to and like how beautiful the world truly is, right? And the three beeps dropped. And I was like, hey, dude, I got to go see if I'm on this box. And I turned around and my gear was on the floor. And I'm like, why is my gear there? And I ran over and I was like, hey, are you? And it was the volunteers They're like, oh, yeah, we kicked you off. You're good to go. And I'm like, good to go. Like, well, where am I going? And the engine was already out. So the squad was the only thing that was there. And it was a different squad from down the road because ours was out for maintenance. So I was like, well, I'm getting on there. Like, I'm not going to sit here at the firehouse. So I threw my gear up on there. I was like, hey, Cap, I'm, I'm coming with. All right, good to go. And um so we took off, right? We took a ride on market and went all the way down. And we actually got uh, met up with the truck company that got right in front of us, the tiller, um, which was a whole nother story because I was so frustrated with how slow we were going to this call. Um, and I felt like we could be more urgency, but we couldn't get around. And I remember hearing the May Day when we turned on the ball road and the May Day came mm -hmm. out uh, and I had my headset on. I'm just ready to go to work. I didn't really know what I was getting into. Right. And um I remember listening to him and how calm he was. And I was like, all right, it's not a big deal. Like he's clearly going to get out of the situation because he's so calm and it sounds so clear. Like there's no panic. And usually I can like, I've been really in touch with like my intuition of like listening to someone's voice and understanding it very yes. deeply that I really wasn't yes. that concerned. Right. I'm like, all right, well, well, he'll get out. No big deal. So we got on scene um, and we had to hoof it all the way up the yard and Luckily, I was training for triathlons and stuff at that point, and I was in really good shape, and I was in a really clear mindset, and I was very present. I had like cultivated a really radical um, state of being, if you will, and I was really present with what needed to happen at that moment, and we came around the Bravo side, and it was just smoke banking down. like You couldn't even barely get through. I remember like grabbing my partner and pulling him through because we were now four on the squad because I just jumped on. We usually run three staffing, right? Right. And got him around the corner. And I remember them putting a ladder down into the hole that he had fallen in through. And I remember seeing that and be like, all right, well, that's where he's at. Right. And chief was like, go figure out a way to get in on the Delta side and get into that basement. So we went around the basement and my captain went down the stairs to force the door. Um, I mean, and the conditions at this point were, were burly, right? It was like, it was intense, but there was no like thinking about that as much as like, all I know is I need to get there. That's all I need to know yeah. right now. Um, right. And we can do it if we're quick to our feet, right? So we got to the top of the stairs and I masked up, gloved up, and then I ran down the stairs to help Cap force this door. Um, and I had my axe and I I think we changed out the uh, the halligan that he was using because he was using like an officer tool. And I think we changed it out at that moment. And then um, literally, man, it was one of those times where it was like we popped the door and before that door was even like, it like opened and we checked the condition, but it was like, it was bad. We knew it was bad. The conditions were terrible, but there really wasn't an option besides going in there and getting our, our brother. Right. Yeah. Um, and it was one of those situations to where like my technician and I clicked in and we were gone. Like it wasn't, we were waiting on for cap to mask up or the other guy to mask up. We were going. 
Um, and I remember like going in a few crawls and I was like hanging onto his foot at first being like, dude, like this is, I can't see a damn thing. We need to figure this out now kind of situation. And then I remember that little voice in my head, right. That I was very aware of that went back to my training and went back to all these books that I was reading about what happens to the nervous system when it goes into fight or flight. Right. And number one is like your, your senses go away, your ears go away. And I'm like, well, I need you ears. And I remember saying like, stop, stop breathing and listen. And I was about 20 to 25 feet in that building. Again, like pitch black, can't see nothing. And I was just, I let go of the man, a couple of steps in uh, my technician and I just stopped. And I remember just hearing like a little tiny thing to my right. And I thought it was his pass alarm. And I went up to like reach that way. And I reached a door handle. I was like, holy shit. And I turned the handle and pushed the door open and I heard it really strong right there. And that's mm -hmm. when I was like, Walty, get over here, dude. We grabbed them and we went in and it was chaos because there was, there was boxes everywhere. So we were trying to throw boxes out of the way to find them. Right. And we finally found them and I kind of scooted him up into my lap. And that was like where I heard his last breath. Like I heard the, and I remember being like, dude, we got to go now. Like it's time to yeah. go now. Right. Yeah. Cause I had chosen not, not to bring the rip pack with because a week before that, two weeks before that, we actually did a writ scenario and I kept questioning, Hey man, do we bring the rip pack in or not? And they're like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, well, is he breathing or is he not? Does he need it or does he not? Because this thing will absolutely slow me down. If I can make the grab now and move without it, I'm going to be better off. And when I was standing at the top of the stairs, Cap looked up at me and I was like, are you good with not bringing this? He's like, your choice. And I was like, no, I don't want it, right? We can make this grab quick. And the second that I grabbed him up in there and I heard that breath, I knew it was time to roll. Like, we're going to do what we can to package him, but we got to get out of here. So we tried clearing some boxes out of the way. And um, again, like you can kind of hear the steam conversion up above us because the hole was still there. And uh the condition, like there was nothing to see at all. I remember seeing like a, a red light kind of flashing and we kept trying to silence his pass alarm, but I couldn't find it. I kept grabbing his, it must've been his mic. I was grabbing something. I can't, I, I couldn't feel it. Right. So then I'm like, let's get for the DRD. And I kept trying to get the DRD out and I couldn't reach it because it was up under his pack. So I was like, all right, dude, let's just drag his pack. And we made a plan and we went to pull his pack and it slid like almost off his whole body. And I'm like, dude, it's wow. not strapped. It's not strapped. And I was like, I want to go convert him. So I like stood on my technician's knee and I jumped over top of Josh. And I remember like falling into his lap and trying like all these boxes still kept falling on top of us that my technicians keep trying to clear. And I was trying to find his waist belts and we couldn't do it. Like I couldn't find him anywhere and all the shit. And that was when I was like, it's time to roll now. It's getting bad in here. We have no options to do anything else besides get him out of this environment right now. So I chose to just put both his feet over my shoulders and I just put my face into his, his belly. And I was like, let's go now. And our, it was a captain off um, from, I think he was on the engine company at Urbana, was right there at the door who actually radioed in. Cause I went to radio in that we had found him and he had done it for me. So I knew that he, our cap was there and kind of guiding us back to that door. So I literally just put my face in his gut and just started running. Like I just started running. And I knew the direction I kind of wanted to go. And then the technician, he grabbed, I don't know if he had his arms or part of his coat. And then we just literally just got guided right out, man. It was really, it was one of those divine things that it was like, I was there to, to witness it. Um, and it was, it was something that words can't really put, you can't really put it into words, right? It was like yeah. all the stars aligned and we got him right. out of there. And I remember getting him out of there. And the first thing that I wanted to do was to strip him of his clothes because that was what I had already programmed into my mind because I went to uh, a training like two years prior at Philly and they were talking about how important it is to learn how to get firemen out of their gear right. in that situation. So that's literally the first thing I went to. Like I got out there and I went to start unbuckling everything. And I remember a firefighter looking at me, he's like, not here, get him up the stairs. So I grabbed the leg over my shoulder and we carried him up the stairs and I went to do a couple buckles and I literally had to unclick and throw my mask off. And I, I threw up a whole bunch right there in the bushes because okay. I was just like, I was taxed. Right. Yeah. Um, and then I came back over and helped work on them for a while. 
And I feel like there were so many people that were just in shock. Um, and I think that why I wasn't in shock at that point and I was able to stay present and do my job was because of my mindful practice. And I didn't know Josh that well. I hadn't worked a whole lot with him and had that 20 years of camaraderie that some of these guys did, right? So I was able to bring something to the, the table there of like trying to bring some clarity even after, you know, and um, they flew him out. And I remember like not thinking that he was going to die. Like I remember being like, he'll be okay. Like we got him out, dude. We just pulled that guy out so fast, man. Like that was, that was wild, but we're going to be okay, you know? And then a couple other things happened after when he got flown out and we got put back into that basement that I was pretty frustrated with for a long time that we decided to choose that route. And it was really hard. That was a hard time for me to overcome um, once all those things transpired, right? Because you're able to like, come back to reflect upon. And there were some things that went down that were really frustrating to me that cultivated an even more opportunity for me to really dive deep into the darkness and the anger and the grief um, through that healing process, right? In order to gain what I needed to gain out of that. Yeah. I mean, there's so much here. So much I, here. I, I wonder. Sorry, that was kind I, of a I, quick rendition of no, that. I, that's, that's okay. Um, what I think is really interesting, and I'm, I'm curious, though, when when he was packaged and, and transported, I mean, you now have a few seconds to reflect, and you thought that he was going to pull through. Yeah. We, we got in there quick. We found him, packaged him, got him out. Gave him, we we're giving him aid, you know, uh, and so on. So that, that thought, and then... And I agree with you, too. I think so often people are shocked at something like that because they just don't ever think they're going to have to deal with that in their career. That's it. And so there's all these different things. When you when you had a second to kind of take a knee after all of that, what was that like for you? Well, it was intense, right? Because I was actually at, at the same time I was planning my wife's surprise 40th birthday which there was like, I don't know, 80 to 100 people coming. There was a lot of people coming. My family was flying in the next day to take my oh, children. Wow. Um, all these things were still going on. So I didn't really have a lot of time right away to reflect upon it. And which I think was beneficial in a way at that moment. Um, but my family came into town and were able to watch my kids and I had to go back to that event, right? Like I literally went from cleaning up this old barn without my wife knowing and trying to play this like secret game, trying to build the surprise party for her to, Hey pops, can you come with me? And yeah. take, we got to go to this, this fire. I got to have this investigation now where all these people are going to ask me all these crazy questions and I need to like now relive this thing. Right. So I got to relive this so many different times and I look back now and I'm so thankful for some of the dudes that I work with is mm -hmm. the bottom line. I think that change comes from within personally develop me developmentally in the department. Like the change comes from within and it only took like two dudes that really changed my trajectory of where I was going back into an alignment and to where I didn't have any regret. Right. And, um, one of the firefighters, RJ, which I think you know very well, mm -hmm. who's just an incredible soul, he, he contacted me and was like, hey, dude, what time are you showing up to the funeral and what do you need from me? And I was like, number one, I'm not going. You know, I've already been through that whole thing with like the, the bicycle tragedy and I was like, I'm not doing the memorial ride. Same thing. I was like, well, I'm not, I'm not going. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's all I really have to say about that. And he just like, was on the phone. He was like, all right, bro, I get you. But uh, that's not an option. This ain't about you. So you need to do what you need to do. And I'll be there for you. What do you need from me? And I said, wow. well, shit, I think you're probably right here. Thank you for that, for changing my perspective. And it isn't about me. So thank you. Even though I felt like it was a lot about me, right? Because I was directly related to that. So thank you for shifting my perspective of that. And I need my wife next to me and I need you to wait for me at the front door. He was like, done. And at this point they were trying to like put all these people in a place to where they wanted all these shifts to sit together. And I was like, I'm not going without my wife, dude, period. And he was able to make all that shit go down. 
which was something that I needed really more than I knew I needed. Right. I needed that. Um, I needed to pay that respect basically, yeah. you know, and going through that, um, was difficult and it was hard to like, cause I showed up a little late. Um, and like I walked in with my wife and like, I don't know if people knew that I was so part of it or still didn't even know. Some people still don't know if I was a part of it. Right. And, um, I think that that showed me at a high level how important people around you in your department, how much impact that they play in your life, you know, and how much that yeah. we could be that person when we become aware enough to know. And RJ knew because he had been through it before and had brothers that had been through it before that understood, right? So I think that was a blessing to me, you know. And then I had another really good friend who's now a captain, Haddad, who offered up his beach house for right after that which was able for my children to be watched by my parents. And we go hang out for two days at a beach house in Oak City where I like sat with my wife and just cried and sat with her and was just there. Right. Which was important. Yeah. I mean, so much of that. And I, I think, you know, we take for granted the relationships we have around us yeah. and then, uh, and then something like this occurs where it's all about those relationships That's it. and, um, you know, for RJ to reach out and had dad to, to do that, but also for you to recognize the importance of what you needed and it was okay to ask for it. That's it. You know, and your wife's your rock and she's the one that needs to be there for you. That can, that can be that ground for you, if you will. Right. Yeah. That support and, and for the department to say, Hey, whatever you need. I mean, that, that's it, man. It's, it's going all in on our people and giving our people what they need. That's it, dude. To be the, be the best they can be and to give them that solace like we we have to be able to give the tools and the in the the latitude for people to take what they need when they need it that's it you know and i think that i'm extremely blessed to have the support that i have at home and my wife is my rock and she's pushed me through all kinds of things and i think that that's a resource that as firefighters we don't reach to enough because we feel like mm -hmm. they don't understand and Unfortunately, they understand better than anybody, right? Because they live through it with us as well. And that's a resource that we need to tap into more and become more aware of and, and use that resource in order to cultivate a, a happier environment at home, right? And I also feel like I'm extremely blessed to have the leadership that we have in uh, Frederick County and the chief that we have that's willing to give you those things that you need and be willing to have an open mind uh, to cultivate an environment for people to change and heal, even if it goes against the norm of the fire department, because the norm is broken right now. And we need to mm -hmm. cultivate an environment that's more aligned with our growth. And instead of being going through PTSD, maybe we talk about a little bit more of like the traumatic growth process and how we can actually grow from trauma because it's inevitable in, in our lifestyle. It's inevitable in our job. And maybe if we put more focus and presence on that, we can cultivate a, an environment that is a development of more growth in life in general. And something that's been coming forward with that is the cultivation that we're doing with um, our recruits in the Academy and cultivating more of a mindful space and having wellness Wednesdays where we can come in and like tomorrow I'm teaching yoga to these recruits. And it's like, it's, it's awesome to me. And it's such a blessing that I have the opportunity to come in as a firefighter, as a PT staff to teach these dudes yoga because it was so important to me. And it, like I was able to see firsthand of what it did to my life and how I was able to work through some of my trauma by just breathing into your body, right? Like what a rad opportunity that is for a department to start moving in that direction of like, look, these things are bad. They happen. Let's talk about how we can give you tools to use along the way to get you into a lifestyle that's more aligned with your dreams. Because as a firefighter, we have so much time to cultivate a radical life and a radical lifestyle and have so much family time, but we don't talk about that because we get stuck in this, well, all I want to do is work because I'm comfortable there. And that's, that's unfortunate because you're just surrounded by people that are like-minded that are broken, or I just want to drink my life away. And it's like, let's start talking yeah. about other opportunities and areas where we can grow and change that's actually cultivating a lifestyle that can be better into the world that we're currently living in. TJ, I got to ask, I mean, you know, you today speaking with you, this conversation is uh, incredibly motivating and powerful in so many different ways for me personally. But I think a lot of people are going to get so much out of this conversation. But I have to think after that 
the the Josh Laird line of duty death and and being a hands on participant in the in the process um, from from the fire through the whole process of reporting and interviews and reliving it and funerals and and every single guy coming up to you and saying something to you you're constantly reliving this moment I have to think did that make you question a lot of what you thought along the way I mean you you know before we got to the line of duty you were telling me how things were falling in line and you know you're concentrating on yourself and focusing on yourself and putting yourself in a better place yeah. and I think all of that helped you when you're in that lights out situation in the basement to remove Joe. yeah absolutely uh, you know and i but afterwards i gotta think though you had to question some oh things. yeah i was questioning everything right i was questioning everything yeah. and i was questioning my beliefs i was questioning if i was right because a lot of things that i thought had happened and said that had happened was going down differently in the interviews and i was questioning that mm. i'm like well why are you saying these things that's not how it went down and my perception of my reality in that moment was very different than what was being painted, right? And that was really yeah. frustrating to me. And I didn't quite understand that. And like what I kept asking myself, like, what is the opportunity to grow from this? How can I grow from this? You know, and I started to get angry again and started to be like lashing out. And it was like, it was again one of those moments where like I need something hard. It's time to do some hard shit again, you know? And that's when I signed up for the Iron Man. And I was like, it's yeah. time, dude. Let's, let's rock this. It's time. I know that my spiritual journey usually aligns with my physical journey. It's time to do something really insane right now. And yeah. I think as you grow and as you go through these traumas to find the gift in there, if you will, I would say the gift that's come out of that environment and what happened that day was the gift of like urgency and time. Like I don't leave my house now without kissing everyone in my family because it might be the last yeah. time. I don't leave my house now without looking at every single one of them in the eye and saying, I love you. Period. That fish photo was a magical moment between you and your wife. And it could have been that last. That's photo. it, dude. And, and I was so blessed. And I showed in my presentation, there was a photo the next day of me in the lake with my whole family floating and being like, I'm so blessed to be here, dude. Like I can't take this for granted anymore. You know? Wow. Yeah. So I think as sure. you, try to move through your traumas, you have to give it a voice. You have to give your trauma a voice, which I'm so blessed to be on this podcast right now because of that. Like, If we don't give our trauma a voice and a narrative of how we want to steer it, it's going to steer our own life and it's probably going to be in a negative way, right? Because that's just the patterns that we go through. So it's like giving it a voice and speaking about it so that other people that are going through these situations can understand a little bit different perspective so they can know they're not alone is so important, you know? So I've like really made it my, my purpose in this department is to really try to cultivate a more of a mindful space, you know? And I'm, I'm the Maryland state ambassador now for a place called mind the frontline, which is all for mm. uh, mental well being, And they have 24 seven peer support, you know, and I'm, I'm currently, uh, they asked me to write a chapter and a book for them, which is a blessing for me to do. Um, and then really trying to cultivate, a more of a mindful space in the academy because you're in that environment to where like these dudes are here to learn. These dudes don't have another option to learn. If you can give them the tools that they can need to better their lives, let's do that. Right. So I think the more that you can use your traumas as inevitably a way to express what you went through in a way that can help someone else, like you're giving it a voice, you're giving it a narrative and you can work through those times for sure. How about a department that's giving you the opportunity to share? Yeah. A department that's willing to give you alternative ways of dealing, recognizing that this job is full of stresses and the job is full of trauma. That's it. And we need to, we all deal with it a little bit differently. And so why not expose our people, especially in the academy level, and then continuing education along the way, that there's a lot of a lot of different variations out there of how you can cope or deal with what we do with every day. That's it, man. I'm really blessed for the department I'm in for that open mindset, but it also came yeah. through a lot of adversity and a lot of persistence. I wasn't going to give up, and I'm not going to give up until I feel that I've done everything in my power to be able to give these other people an opportunity to grow and to change their lives and to realize that we're here to, to live our dreams, man. And we go through shit, but it's just an opportunity to grow. Everything's an opportunity to learn and grow and to get out of our old patterns and beliefs. And it's like, I'm going to do everything I can while I'm here to cultivate that environment for the people around me. Cause I love them. You know, they're my brothers and my sisters. 
I, I have to, th I mean, what an incredible story, you know, the whole, your whole journey. I mean, and you're only 37 years yeah. old. So, I mean, I'm excited to see five, 10, 20 years from now, you know, what you're going to be able to do for not only yourself and your family, but for all of us. Yeah. I mean, I, I just, I, I, I take away so much value in this conversation today with you. And uh, I'm so grateful for opportunities like this. Yeah. I mean, National Fire Radio for me has been a, a, a project that I, I could have never never ever understood what it has done for me as a person and conversations like this today for the last hour and a half with you yeah. makes me feel i don't know i need more i got to do more i want to do more i need to focus on myself i need to have some moments and you don't know when that last time is gonna that's be. it man and yeah and we take life for granted we take those around us for granted we take our health for granted all of it. That's it. And you don't really look at it until you have to, right? And if like, you choose to look at it without having to, if you will, you can change some of your ways so you don't find yourself in those moments, you know? And I think... Yeah, or you turn a blind eye to that's it. it. I don't want to admit that, that I'm not doing this, or I could be better here, but it's easier if I don't talk about it or look in the mirror. That's it, 100%, you know? And I think you want to have... You need that want and that drive to grow, you know? And my wife and I have become coaches at this point, life coaches to try to help cultivate a more of a positive environment, you know, and it's been so fun to learn more and dive more into it. We're currently creating a, like a two month uh, course that's just called the framework to freedom because it's all about like framing your life in a way that's going to cultivate the most happiness you can possibly get out of your life. Cause you want to squeeze all the happiness and love out of it that you can, but that takes a lot of discipline and, Managing your time, managing your habits, managing your dreams, managing your goals, managing your boundaries. Boundaries are so huge in cultivating your happiness because it's okay to say no, right? And we feel it's so bad to say that. So we're building a course right now to help people kind of work through that. And we're super stoked for that. I'm super stoked for the future because there's so much movement and change in the departments. And I'm, uh, I'm really blessed for this opportunity. And thank you a lot for having me. No, this was incredible. It was uh, it was a highlight for me for sure. Mm. And um, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, a lot of people, a lot of guys, push back against conversations like yeah. this. They push back about the guy walking around in flip flops and and has this new perspective on life, and he meditates and he does yoga and all these things. It's so easy for guys to push back against somebody like that. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, and I'm sitting here listening to all this and I'm like life coach and this and that. And if you told me about life coaches five years ago, I would have been like, okay, whatever, that was me. right? Yeah. yeah. That's what I'm saying. And now I'm at a place. I don't know if I'm signing up for a life coach, but for the last half hour and a half, I just got a free session with you. Yeah. And you know what? I feel good. Yeah, sweet. Like there's, there's something to this. I think when we can let our guard down, a little bit have some humility and understand that there's some things that we just can't control but we can certainly talk about it and maybe maybe put some rational rational thought to it in, in a different perspective That's it. or from somewhere else um i think we're better off for it and uh you know i just i want to thank you for what you're doing um i think that you know you've been through some serious traumas and for you to tell your story today you know you could go through life not sharing these stories and not telling people your personal journey. It takes a risk to put yourself out there to talk about yourself and, and your struggles and, and how you come out from it, or maybe things that you're still dealing with. You know, I think that all of that is really important. And for you to do that today, man, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, you're certainly going to make an impact with a lot of listeners. I know you. Yeah. Will. Thank you so much for the opportunity, you know, and I feel like just acknowledging that some of the things we go through in times is enough to take the power away, you know, so you go through a hard time, just acknowledge it for what it is and, and be okay with speaking about it. You know, it might help somebody along the way because sometimes life is tough, dude. But if you can get through those times and be better on the other side, then show the guys behind you or next to you that there is light at the end of the tunnel. Dude, I promise you there is. I love it, man. TJ, thank you. Thanks for spending some time with me this yes, morning, sir. man. This was a, a great conversation. Thank you for, uh, for being a part of this. Yeah, man. I appreciate you a lot. Thank you so much. Awesome. Yeah, I appreciate you. Stay right here. I'm going to sign off the podcast. I'm going to come right back. To right, okay, don't go in. Oh, and if anybody wants to reach out, I mean, you know, uh, is there a way that people can get a hold of you or, or an email? Absolutely. Or a website it's just or Real Elevation Coach at Gmail. Okay, Real Elevation Coach at Gmail. Yes, sir. Awesome. We'll put that in the I notes. Appreciate that. And, uh, and I, I challenge our listeners if they have some questions or comments, man, reach yeah, out. Yeah, please and do. I know that you certainly 
take care of it. Yeah, for sure. Good. Stay right here, TJ. I'll be right back All to right, you, man. man. Appreciate you. Guys, thanks so much for tuning in for another episode of the National Fire Radio podcast. Um, and a, a powerful episode today um, with a lot of life lessons learned and how we come out on the other side, man. And uh, I'm going to take this conversation and, and hold it close because uh, it resonated with me very much so. So do me a favor. Episodes like this need to be talked about. And we can make the job better when we talk about the job. So take this conversation. Take it back to the firehouse and talk about it, because when we talk about the job, we're making the job better. I'll see you at the next one. Jeremy, National Fire Radio. National Fire Radio.